So welcome to the first of the Theatre Delhi Social Model Starters. I'm Caroline Moore, I'm curator for the Social Model and More Festival. So that's peaking in two weeks of workshops and exciting new theatre in London and Sheffield in November. And my first guest is Ashok Kumar Mystery, also known as Ashok. He's an artist, writer and activist, amongst other things. I wanted to interview Ashok after I read a great article he wrote about the challenges global majority disabled artists face in getting noticed. I think that's a really big deal and definitely shouldn't be an add-on, which is why Ashok is starting us off. But let's go back to basics. The medical model says doctors are going to fix us disabled creatives, and they don't. Well, the social model says society should change to fit around us, but it hasn't. We need more or maybe different or, or it's complicated. So at Theatre Delhi, we started by listening to what disabled creatives thought. We can check out a huge range of what you said on our website, from I love the social model to fuck the social model. And we use those ideas to guide our caller. We got so many great responses and sadly we just can't include them all. So these starters are trying to make sure we don't miss out on some of the big issues. And they're only 15 minutes to make them easy to fit in your day. So let's go. I'm Caroline. I'm a skinny white woman, age 60, with scruffy short hair and big purple glasses. And now Ashok, he's why we're here. Hi Ashok, thank you for taking part. Could you describe yourself please? Hi, thanks very much for having me here, Caroline. Um, I'm a greying brown man of Indian origin, um, clean shaven, um, wearing a maroon shirt. Uh, so we've only got, thank you for taking part, Ashok. We've only got 15 minutes, so we've had to agree some priorities to talk about, but there's plenty more good stuff from Ashok. So after this, please, go and check out some links that we're going to put underneath the, this um, recording to his work and ideas. So let's start. Could you please tell us which bit of yourself you're unapologetic about? Okay, so that idea of unapologetics comes from uh, the Onyx Collective that I'm part of. And when we talk about unapologetics, it's about presence and it's about um, not being afraid of yourself and not apologizing for who you are and the way you are um for me i think um unapologetics is all about me not apologizing about the fact that i forget stuff and not apologizing for not being able to read stuff properly or needing a screen reader or audio um, not apologizing for uh, misunderstanding things that other people understand um, and seeing things in a different perspective. I, th I think it's it's all about kind of not apologizing for who you are. And it goes into the way that I've tried to kind of bring, um, uh, see other people around me as well. Um, so people who I thought were who I would otherwise not give the time of day to or not consider in the right way it stopped me it's it stops me and tell, tells me to take a step back and actually understand the person that's really high-minded of you I'm an awkward bastard and 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 will refuse the word sorry I, I use the word thank you a lot more which basically I say thank you and at that point there, people think that they're going to do something good for me. And they do, which is an amazing superpower that I appear to have just saying the word thank you rather than sorry. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Ashok. Um, gosh, um, this idea of the awkward bastard, it, it really resonates with me. And um, we it kind of gets me to think about why we're awkward bastards as well. Um, and why people are the way they are, why they think in a particular way. All the things that have happened in their life, you can almost kind of uh, see it written on their on, on their face. Um, uh, and people don't aren't awkward just for the sake of being awkward, that, um, that they are um, something or other for a reason. I just had a note put through the door of my kids. I'll have to pick it up in a sec. So can you, I'm going to go on to another question, unless you think it's a vital 
you know, in which case you should go and save their lives. But if you don't think so, then I'm going to ask you, can you remember when you first heard about the social model? Was it a useful concept for you? Was it, was it working in any useful way for you? And has it ever worked usefully for you? I think the social model, gosh, um, it was a while ago. And it was a revelation. It really, I found it life-changing in the sense that um, for once, I wasn't the problem and um, I could actually kind of start to see the reason why I had a problem or why I had problems in the world. So I wasn't the, the actual, the reason why things either went wrong or went, you know, kind of a belly up. Um, and for me, the social model, the, the, the main thing is about how the world is designed. The world is designed in a, in, in a particular way. Like um, we live within operating systems, I guess, um, like um, our political culture, our um, uh, educational culture and all of that. They're, they're, it's a bit like operating systems. So you have different operating systems on different devices. And if you can kind of see that, sometimes the operating system isn't made for you or is only made to actually kind of create a particular outcome for a particular type of person, then you can actually see what you need to do to actually circumvent or try and kind of um, um, patch those problems. I'm using programming terminology here. But, but can, I mean, like, I can't patch, I, I can't, get around so i can't patch stairs for me if you see what i mean I no but for me. but legislation can legislation like with teeth you know we can campaign and we can um patching is as much about being an activist as it is about um um like when we talk about patching it's not about us making the changes ourselves it's about us pushing for the change as well um so we don't have to actually create the change um ourselves with our bare hands we that we can actually create um a permanent lasting change through campaigning and and you know kind of voicing the problems that are, that are, that are at stake I, I, I desperately want to ask you my third question, but I'm just going to come back to you on this because you say I can I could argue for things, but I'm tired. I'm really tired. It takes me loads of time to get up in the mornings. And so the process of me using up my small amount of available time in arguing with some bastards who aren't providing a load of things is just fills me with horror. Yeah. Um so I guess then it's a choice is either we live with the world as it is or we try and change it and if there isn't a kind of like a formal path to change it then we use our own informal paths to change it but um if we work together and that's the whole idea of kind of collectivism and, and so on if we work together then the um the that burden for that change is lessened to a degree and not everyone needs to be an activist um the problem is that when you're from a marginalized group it's almost as if um activism is um what is it um it's inherent to what you do so you can be one of two people you can either um uh, just allow things to wash over you or you can kind of just hit back with things and just not accept things as the way they are um and i think I, i'm not sure maybe it's genetic that um because i know other people in my family were like this as well they hit things head on and um we don't take things for granted i'm going to move on i'm really sorry i've just i diverted you told me that when you were 40 you had a big breakdown which made you which started you thinking about how you were and how but how you actually get pigeonholed as disabled or brown so that means half or maybe less than half of your actual whole self do you want to say more please yeah oh uh, that's a difficult time in my life that was um but it was um very 
poignant in the sense that I it was the first time that I started to understand myself. So um, before that, um, I was masking all the time and I was kind of um, uh, what everyone else wanted me to be. And I, we suffered a bereavement um, in our family, um, you know, a, a close family member. And um, it changed a lot for me in the sense of kind of um, the way that our house, um, our family functioned and so on and so forth, brought out a lot of kind of uh, problems and so on. But out of that, all of the stuff that was, that I was pushing down of myself suddenly started to leap out. So it was like a cognitive pressure that had been built building up that was suddenly kind of um, uh, the lid had come off and was out in the open. And I started to actually start to question myself and try to understand who I was um, before this time it was almost as if I was trying to create this jigsaw of myself without any image without the box and everything was all over the place you know some some pieces were hidden and so on and so forth and at least what I was able to do is start to turn through this process start to turn the pieces of the jigsaw the right way up so I started to understand myself and I could see that there was some form of map there so, yeah, for me, that was an, a, a, an amazing time. And I started to read up on things like the social model and neurodiversity was just coming out then. So I'm going to go back to my point about you getting pigeonholed as either disabled or brown. And you've told me about the time when you were in contact with somebody who probably you, you, we're not going to name. Who Tell me about that, if you don't mind. Yeah. So it was um, uh, a... a public body and they were trying to they put this initiative together to take marginalized people to this theater conference um, in another country and it was fantastic but it was all very very last minute and you had to apply and so on and so forth and um i got the application i could either apply as a disabled person or i could apply as someone from a, a an ethnic minority background and i chose to um, focused on my identity as a disabled person because it was very important to me then and they said no you can't do that because it was easier for me to apply as a, a an ethnic minority background it's almost as if the visual you know the, the thing that you could see was much easier for other people to understand or rather um the thing that people could see of me that marginalized me was easier for other people to understand uh, and I found that really distasteful really because it was as if they wanted to control my identity but did you work did you work with, did you get it did you work with these people I did I went to the conference I went as an interloper so and the reason I went was and it kind of went beyond you know uh, um uh I went against myself in, in a sense, against my principles, but um, I wanted to see how they um, worked with people. I wanted to see how they um, treated people with disabilities, how they approach disabilities. And I learned a lot. I learned about equality in different countries. I learned that um, in uh, other European countries, um, this idea of disability and equality and so on and so forth is very different. The concept is completely different. Um, and um, I learned a lot about this organization as well and how they basically were trying to catch up with themselves and that's where some of the, this this idea of kind of making people choose or not not allowing people to choose rather was was kind of coming from there's so much to i'd love to pick up loads of stuff that we've just said there but i'm going to ask you my next question which is that how you are working amongst other things as part of onyx collective you've already said this is that's creatives from black asian and dual heritage backgrounds who identify as being disabled neurodivergent crit or living with long-term illnesses. Is that what your first art college meant 
when when they said to find your own tribe. I mean, I really don't like that phrase. I don't think you did either. Talk a bit more. Gosh, going back years and years now. Um, when I was at university, I didn't understand myself as neurodivergent. I kind of knew I was dyslexic, but um, th- that was kind of like um, the just the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, and they didn't either. So that they couldn't um, connect with me, and they thought they couldn't connect with me because of my uh, cultural background and it was more my disability so they didn't know about any of that um and so for instance they would pigeonhole people or they were trying to kind of like make an easy solution to something so they tried to get me to kind of go with um other brown people or to kind of um uh associate more with indian art or whatever And the problem is that that wouldn't work for two reasons, because if someone as soon as someone tells me to do something, I want to do the opposite. I'm always asking myself, why has this person asked me to do this and not something else? And the other problem was that. Even kind of culture of diversity, it's not as simple as that. It's not as simple as kind of just banding a bunch of brown people together with onyx it's much different it's not about kind of just banding a bunch of people together it's about making space for people to be who they are and uh, share their experiences um so it's a very very different space and it came out of um a, it was a, a, a something that was put together by um disability arts online in the wake of black lives matter and um the death of george floyd so um it's more about giving people space to be who they want to be but having some sense of kindred spirit so does this mean that you are keeping comfortable um, I don't mean that in a nasty way. Please don't take it in a nasty way. But is are you now you've found people who are have got some similarities with you? Then is it okay to be like that? How does it fit with your idea that you have to be an activist? I just want to give you a chance to respond to that, please. I think um, the problem with activism is, as I said before, is it's something that's inherent to your. Uh, identity as a marginalized person um if you don't shout you don't get anything and um whereas in a lot of cases we're always we're only um uh interacted with if we're if we're in that shouty activist mood whereas what we've created with onyx is a space where we can share if we want to but we don't have to and um, but we can be who we want to be. We don't have to be activists 24-7. Um, and that's, and it's a space that we've created. That, um, although um, uh, DAO, Disability Arts Online, they facilitated it, they haven't kind of controlled that, um, the the conversations amongst us, in a sense. Um, so sometimes you have to switch off being an activist as well because it is as you said it's exhausting um but um what you can do is share experiences of of that or share just general life experiences um or um focus just on your um your on your practice um on on the work that you make so yeah it's kind of like this multifaceted space and no thank you thank you so much for this it's like I'm really aware that I've cut you off and I've not, I've not had, you and I have spoken at much more length. And so I know a little tiny bit how much more there is within you. And so that's why I'm really encouraging everybody to click down below and to link up with more of your art and work, which is super splendid and really worth spending time on in my view. Thank you very much indeed, Asha Kumar. Thank you so much for um, sharing a tiny bit of yourself with us here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.